Hey, welcome back everybody. This is a video for chapter 14, which is all about something called a chi-square distribution. Just to give you a little bit of a sense where this fits in and what we've been talking about the last few chapters, this is that big chart I kind of drew in chapters, you know, 11, 12, 13. And everything in gray we've done before. Here's where chi-squared fits in. We've talked about hypothesis tests for one proportion, hypothesis tests for two proportion, Really what chi-squared is, it's a hypothesis test for many, many different proportions. Three proportions, four proportions, five proportions, something like that. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, just notice that there's no such thing as a, a chi-squared confidence interval over here. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's look at a couple of examples. First of all, when I say chi-squared, it's written like this. This is the capital Greek letter chi. Um, kind of looks like a big capital italic. X. Um, it's spelled C-H-I, but pronounce it chi. And we're going to call it chi-square. Now, I don't know why it's called chi-square instead of chi-squared, um, but it is. So we're going to go with that. If you call it chi-squared, it's not the end of the world. There are basically three flavors of a chi-squared test. Chi-squared goodness of fit test, chi-squared test of independence, and chi-squared test of homogeneity. In section 14.1, we're going to focus on the first one, the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And the next, in section 14.2, we're going to tackle these two. So everything in this video is on the chi-squared goodness of fit test. And again, don't say chi, say chi. So here's our super important chi-squared formula. It's the one really super important formula. Chi-squared, which is kind of like our test statistic. Think about this as kind of like it's not a t-test, it's not a z-test. It's a chi-squared test. This is the test statistic. And then we'll use that to calculate a p-value. Is the sum... Right, this means the sigma means add them all up of observed minus expected o squared over expected. And sometimes it's summarized like this O minus E squared over E with a sigma notation. We're always going to talk about observed and expected counts. So the units here are always number of people, number of individuals, number of things. The units for chi squared will never be anything like feet or inches or pounds or miles per hour. It'll always be number of things. It'll never even be a percent. It's always number of things. So here's kind of our first uh, chi-squared goodness of fit example. And let's just kind of read this. Trick cereal comes in five fruit flavors, and each flavor has a different shape. A curious student methodically sorted an entire box of trick cereal and found the following distribution of flavors for the pieces of cereal. And so here are the numbers that were in this box. And is there evidence to suggest the flavors are not uniformly distributed? So uniformly means the same, right? So first of all, what makes this a chi-squared test goodness of fit test? Well, these numbers are all counts, right? They're number of, in this case, pieces of cereal, okay? And we kind of have many different proportions. Really what we're testing is the proportion of grape equal to the proportion of lemon equal to the proportion of lime equal to the proportion of orange equal to the proportion of strawberry. And very often when you do a chi-squared goodness of fit test, in fact, for all chi-squared tests, it's tough to write the HO and HA, your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, as in symbols. So usually we kind of do it as a sentence. So our HO here is going to be the proportion of all flavors are the same. Now you could write like P1 equals P2 equals P3 equals P4 equals P5 or P grape equals P lemon equals P lime equals P orange equals P strawberry. But usually that's not done. Usually we just write it as an English sentence. Uh, and our alternative hypothesis is the proportion of all flavors is not the same. Okay? Don't write the proportion of all flavors are not equal. In other words, don't write this with not equal to, because really what we're, we're not saying that they're all different. We're saying that they are not all the same. In other words, at least one of them is different. So I, I've seen it actually written two different ways. You can write the proportion of all flavors is not the same, or you can write at least one proportion is different. Those two haws are essentially synonymous. Okay, so that was step one of the inference toolbox. Now let's talk about the conditions you do for uh, a chi-squared. And basically, there's only two. Um, sometimes we have to assume, or we have to talk about it being a simple random sample, if it applies. I'm actually not even sure whether it applies. Are we talking about this particular box of cereal, or are we talking about kind of all trick cereal in general? I'll assume we're talking about one box, so I'll say we'll assume the box is a simple random sample. But you're going to see uh, throughout Chapter 14 that sometimes I'm going to leave off this first SRS check, because you only write that down if it actually applies to the question. There's some problems where we're not even taking the idea of a sample in any way, so we just leave this completely out. 
But so there's kind of two checks for chi-squared. The first check is, is it a simple random sample, if applicable? And sometimes you leave that out. The second check is, is chi-squared appropriate? And you say chi-squared is, here's the rule, chi-squared is appropriate if all expected counts are greater than one and most expected counts are greater than five. Now, what do I mean by expected counts? What I mean by this, how many grapes would you expect to get? We observed 530 grapes, but how many would you expect to get? Well, think about it. If we thought all of these were the same, wouldn't you just add up all the uh, total thing of cereal in the box and divide by five? And if you do that, you get 523 is the expected number. Our observed is 530 grapes. We expect 523 grapes. And in fact, we also expect 523 lemons, 523 limes, 523 oranges, and 523 strawberries. So chi-square is appropriate if all expected counts are bigger than one or most are bigger than five. Well, in this case, hey, look, all expected counts are bigger than five, since all of the expected counts are 523. So hey, chi-square is appropriate. So two different conditions, SRS and appropriate. Notice there's no independence check for chi-square. There's only two conditions instead of three. And now we're ready to do some math. So here's our chi-squared formula. Chi equals the sum of observed minus expected squared over expected. So we do that for each of the five things. So for grape, it's observed is 530 minus expected is 523. That would be 7 on top. Square that over 523 plus, and then we do it for lemon. Observed is 470 minus expected is 523 squared over 523. I put a dot, dot, dot here, but we would do that for each of the other flavors. We do it for grape, lemon, lime, orange, and strawberry. And you add all those up, that's what the sigma notation means, and we get 47.57. Okay? Oh, look, I made a mistake here. Oh, no. Let me correct it. I wrote degrees of freedom as 5, but actually it's 5 minus 1, because it's degrees of freedom as n minus 1 still, so our degrees of freedom is 4. Well, fixed a correction. Isn't that exciting? And then we draw the chi-squared graph. This is something a little bit new. With the chi-squared graph, I haven't showed you this picture before, but it's in your book. The chi-squared distribution is not symmetric, and it's not normal, even looking. It's very much skewed to the right, okay? It kind of always follows this shape, and the higher the degrees of freedom there are, the more it would kind of be over here. The fewer degrees of freedom, it would kind of look like that. Um, but in any event, it's always skewed to the right, and your calculator, can give you, your calculator can give you a good picture of it, and your book has a lot of good pictures of it, too. So here, here's our chi-squared number, 47.57. We always shade to the right for chi-squared. And we get a p-value that's unbelievably small, 1.1 times 10 to the negative 9th. In fact, if you do it on a calculator, it doesn't even show you this because this is so unbelievably small. Okay, just to quickly show you on the calculator how you might do this, okay, um, and we'll do this a lot. We enter the numbers into L1. These are the observed numbers. The expected numbers into L2. For this problem, they're all the same. Then we go over here to test D, chi-squared goodness of fit test. Okay. Um, well, I didn't show this, but it asks you L1, L2, and degrees of freedom. And then we do chi-squared goodness of fit test. It calculates chi-squared. It calculates the p-value. And it um, does this thing called contrib, which actually stands for contribution. That's the contribution each of those things was to chi-squared, the contribution of grape, lemon, lime, orange, and so on. Just to kind of look back up here, I could have done that uh, myself. See under L3, I wrote L1 minus L2 squared divided by L2. That's O minus E squared over expected. Down here, I actually did that. And you see L3 now, these are the numbers. You notice the first number you can kind of see is the same. That number is the same as that number. This is the contribution each of the flavors makes to the 47.57. So if you add up L3, you'll get 47.57. Sometimes this is useful because it can kind of show you, well, which one is um, kind of the most out of whack? You'll see that the first one is actually relatively small because the observed and the expected are pretty close to being the same. But look here at Lime, 420 is a long ways away from 523, so the, the contribution is much higher. Okay, you don't need to do this, but sometimes it's kind of useful in a part B. And you certainly have to know how to do this. So our paragraph is exactly the same in step four of the inference toolbox. There is about a 1.1 times 10 to the negative ninth, which is really, really tiny, chance of getting, and here we just say these observed counts. That's sort of our statistic. By random chance, if 
the null hypothesis is true, and our null hypothesis is the proportion of all flavors are the same. Since this is very unlikely, and I assume they vary because, oh my gosh, look how small this is, we will reject the null hypothesis. Second sentence is exactly the same. There is strong evidence that our alternative hypothesis, our HA, the proportion of flavors are not the same. Okay. Last paragraph is exactly the same. The first sentence is, I think, is a tricky part. There is about a some p-value chance of getting these observed counts by random chance if your null hypothesis is true. Okay, two little notes about chi-squared. Um, the first is there's it's, there's it's always a two-sided test. There's no such thing as a one-sided chi-squared test. In other words, there's no such thing as a chi-squared involving a less than or a greater than. It's always a not equal to idea. Okay? There's also no such thing as a chi-squared confidence interval. There's only hypothesis tests. And the last thing is there are some Part B kind of questions where they say which proportion is the most unusual. And I just mentioned that, but you can look down here at the contributions and say, well, which one has the biggest contribution? That's the one that's the most unusual. In this case, it would be that 420. That was Lyme, wasn't it, I think? Okay. Um, I want to do another example just quickly because in this particular problem, all of the L2s, all of the expected numbers were the same, and that won't always be the case. Let's do an example where that's not the case. So here we go. It says most students taught in most students in a large college statistics class are taught by teaching assistants or TAs. One section is taught by the course supervisor, who's a full-time professor. The distribution of grades for the hundreds of students taught by TAs was this. So this is what we think is the distribution for all the students taught by TAs. Notice these numbers are percents, right? They add to 100%. The grades, however, assigned by the professor to the 91 students he taught, again, hundreds of students taught by TAs, the professor only taught 91 of them, were, and then here are the grades the professor gave. Notice these are counts. These are uh, numbers of students. And then the question is, is there evidence the professor's grade distribution differs from the TA distribution? Okay, step one of the inference toolbox, it's still a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Here, we don't want to say that the proportion of grades are all the same like we did in the tricks question. We don't expect the professor to get the same, give the same number of A's, B's, C's, and D's. What we expect is that the, his proportions are the same as the TA's proportions. Slightly different than the previous example, because here, we're not expecting these to be the same. We're expecting them to be in the same proportion as up here. So look what I wrote for my ho and ha. The proportions of grades given by the professor are not all the same, but the same as the proportions given by the TAs. And then your alternative hypothesis is sort of the opposite. The proportions of grades given by the professor are different than those given by the TAs, or at least one is different, we should probably say. Okay? Just very subtle. From now on, everything's exactly the same, but I want you to see how these two ho's and ha's are slightly different. We're not saying we don't expect the professor to have the same number of A's and B's, we expect the professor to give 32% A's and 41% B's, and so on. Okay, um, conditions. Okay, now it's a little bit weird. Okay, that we observed 22 A's. Well, how many would you expect? Well, look what I was doing over here. We expect him to give 32% A's. So in L2, I'm doing 91 is the total number of students. These numbers add up to 91 times 32%. And that number ends up being 29.12. I calculated L2. In the previous example, all these were the same. Now it's just 32% uh, of 91, 41% of 91, 20% of 91, and 7% of 91. In this particular case, we're not going to talk about it being a simple random sample because I just leave that condition out because we're not really talking about a sample. We're talking about these students. So then... Um, our only condition really is since all expected counts are bigger than 5, and here I wrote the smallest one is 6.57. Sorry, it should be 6. Point, mistake, 6.37. I should say a 3 right there. Uh, oh, no. Um, so since all expected counts are bigger than 5, chi-squared is independent. Chi-squared is appropriate. Now I'm doing exactly what I did before. Chi-squared is observed minus expected squared over expected. The first observed is 22. This first expected is 29.12. Uh, and so I knew 22 minus 29.12 squared over 29.12, and then I would go ahead and I would do that for all the numbers in the list. If I do that, I get that uh, chi-squared is 5.297. I 
I should write down degrees of freedom, which our formula for degrees of freedom is the same. It's n minus 1. So 4 minus 1 equals 3. I'll draw the chi-squared picture and notice it's still skewed like you saw before. Chi-squared here is 5.279. And then you get a p-value of about 15%. And just to share on the calculator, I went back to chi-squared goodness of fit test. I did L1, L2, I calculated it all. I get 5.296, or 7, P, your p-value. And then notice here's the picture. I wanted you to see that picture because the calculator can draw nice chi-squared pictures for you. And you can kind of see how it's very skewed. A little bit more skewed than the previous one because our degrees of freedom this time is 3, whereas in the previous one it was 4. So the fewer degrees of freedom, the more skewed it is. Let's say it was like 10 degrees of freedom, it might look something like this. Still skewed, but not quite skewed as much. And then our last paragraph is exactly the same. There's about a 15% chance of getting the professor's grades by random chance if his proportions are the same as the TAs. Okay? There's about a 15% chance, that's our p-value, of getting the observed counts, the professor's grades, by random chance if our null hypothesis is true, his proportions are the same as the TAs. In this case, this is likely, so we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis, and therefore there is not evidence that the proportions of the professor's grades are different. Okay, exactly the same paragraph. Okay, I don't know why I put this here, but actually it's a great website, freerice.com. You can uh, learn vocabulary and uh, give food to uh, hungry people. There you go, this wraps up the section 14.1. Most random way I've ended a video yet.